foundational provisions in Article 10 of the National Electrical Code. Our objectives is to recall that listed and labeled equipment shall be installed and used in accordance with any instructions included in the listing or labeling. Uh, describe the requirement in Article 110 pertaining to selective coordination. Clarify the provision that requires unused openings to be closed. Explain terminal connection torque stipulations. Summarize our flash hazard warning label stipulations. Describe the general provisions uh, to available uh, that, that pertain to available fault current and clarify the requirement for locking a disconnect disconnecting means in the open position. Now, if you're familiar with Article 110, you know there's a lot of other uh, requirements and provisions in this article. In fact, the, the, the section that comes after we finish in here is spaces about electrical equipment. And next month, uh, with Grace, we'll do another webinar just covering that one section, uh, 110.26. All right, so um, let's go ahead and, and talk about the first one is jump into 110.3b. Equipment that is listed, there is a change in the 2020 edition. And uh, with my PowerPoints, uh, I have the 2020 icon uh, when it designates a change from the previous edition to the newest edition. And uh, typically, I'll, if it's just part of it that has changed, I'll have it highlighted with, with red bold. So what has changed was, it used to say equipment shall be installed and used in accordance with any instructions, including the listing or labeling. There was a small change now, it says equipment that is listed, labeled, or both has to be installed and used in accordance with any instructions included in the listing or labeling. What that means is, read the instructions. And if the majority of the audience today is, is guys, then guys, we understand that typically we have problems in reading instructions. And, and that's, just, that's just our makeup, that's who we are. Here's an example of complying, uh, reading and complying with the instructions. Uh, the installation instructions to this uh, Miller air conditioner um, states to use only copper conductors. Uh, it says to, and, and then the instructions, it says to avoid the risk of fire or equipment damage, use only copper conductors. Uh, it, you may not be familiar with who I am. I wrote and illustrated an article in Electrical Contractor Magazine for 19 years. I I've written electrical books and I do my own illustrations as well. And typically I will put my brand name, although there is really a, a Miller brand. Um, this, this is uh, the Charles Miller brand of air conditioner in my drawing. Selective coordination, 110.10. This is not titled selective coordination. The title of this section in water in 110.10 says circuit impedance short circuit current ratings and other characteristics the overcurrent and, and the, the section says the overcurrent protector device the total impedance the equipment short circuit rating and other characteristics of the circuit to be protected has to be selected and coordinated to permit the circuit protector device used to clear a fault to do so without extensive damage to the electrical equipment of the circuit this is typically referred to as selective coordination. All right, so here's an example. Without selective coordination, what happens is the branch circuit overcurrent device may not be the only overcurrent device that opens. Uh, in the illustration on the next slide, um, two feeder overcurrent devices and the main service overcurrent device have opened as a direct result of the fault because in the, the illustration on the next slide, it is, it does not have, it is not designed uh, with, and uh, selective coordination was not uh, implemented into, into the electrical system. In the next slide, the white fuse with red stripes represents overcurrent devices that have lost power unnecessarily because the fault was not limited to the branch circuit. 
So here's the illustration. We have a fault in a branch circuit. The branch circuit overcurrent device tripped, but other things tripped up the line as well. And in fact, everything up the line tripped. So what that means is the, the, the fuse with the red and the red stripe means that all of these other things were disconnected from power. They lost power uh, unnecessarily. All right, so in, in the next example, it, it's going to show a fault that has selective coordination. Uh, the next illustration shows a properly designed and installed electrical system with selective coordination. The red fuse represents an overcurrent device that opens as a, as a direct result of the fault. The branch circuit overcurrent device opens before any upstream overcurrent device opens. All right, so this one it has is designed and installed with selective coordination. Now we have a fault that is in a, a motor and it is limited to that branch circuit for that motor only. Uh, nothing else is effective upstream from that. 110.12, mechanical execution of work. This is, it, it says electrical equipment shall be installed in a, in a neat and workmanlike manner. Uh, what this, this really means a neat and professional manner. Uh, years ago, I, I thought about writing a, a code change proposal to have it changed to um, a neat and professional manner. And, and the, the correct wording and more of a legal terminology is workmanlike. And, and plus, that term has been in the code since 1947. I really, in, in the National Electrical Code since 1947. Not, I wasn't around during that time. I don't know that it was in there. I've just seen it in other older editions of the National Electrical Code books. 110.12a. This one is for unused openings. Unused openings should be closed. Just a good general statement. Unused openings should be closed. Now, a few editions back, they did add some, some other provisions that every opening in a, in a box did not have to be closed. We'll get to that in a minute. So uh, with here, we've got a four square box and a, a mud ring or plaster ring. Uh, for some reason, the knockouts, uh, there was a couple of them that were knocked out. So we're using uh, knockout seals to close the unused opening. Well, how does it have to be closed? Well, it said the code book says the protection must be substantially equivalent to the wall of the equipment. Uh, so, and, and using one piece of duct tape on the outside is not substantially equivalent to the wall of the equipment. Well, how about one on the outside and one on the inside? No, no, don't even consider that. Don't even consider uh, duct tape. It has to be substantially equivalent to the wall of the equipment. Uh, not, no telling. I mean, you can use um, any number of layers of duct tape, and that is still not going to be substantially equivalent uh, to the wall of the enclosure. Or I mentioned uh, unused, not all unused openings have to be closed. Well, it, this was kind of an under, un, understood for years and years and years in the code book. And, and then I guess some people figured out, well, wait a minute, we, we can't close every opening in, in a junction box or panel board. And so there was a, a code change that was put in a number of editions back and it said certain openings are permitted. Well, what are they? Openings intended for the operation of the equipment openings intended for mounting purposes and openings permitted as part of the design of the equipment. All right, so it, you, you have holes in uh, junction boxes and in panel boards that are intended for mounting purposes. Uh, holes like that do not have to be closed. It, and that's, it, it really went without saying for years and years and years, uh, but now it is specifically stated as such uh, in the NEC. 110.14a, terminals for more than one conductor. 
and terminals used to connect aluminum wire shall be so identified. And in this illustration was a, an industrial plant I was at years and years ago. And the, the disconnect you can see in the top, it has two conductors, uh, two sets of conductors under one uh, lug, uh, a single lug, and that is a code violation. Uh, there are, um, for the most part, as a general rule, absolutely never put two conductors under one uh, terminal. Um, in some panel boards, they are listed for that it would be permitted to have two equipment grounding terminals uh, of, of a certain sizes under the same lug, but that's it. Uh, neutrals or grounding conductors, uh, hot conductors or ungrounded conductors are never permitted uh, under the same. Now, if if for some reason something needed to be tapped off and there was only one set of lugs there, if it is, if it would be permitted to tap off of that, uh, which I, this, there's no way, these are different size uh, conductors and, uh, and, and just, if, if it would be permitted, then the, the lugs would have to be changed out to double barrel lugs or a lug that permits uh, two conductors under one terminal, which you're not going to find that. But uh, all right, torque connection. This has been a change uh, from the 2017 to the 2020 and the 20, um, for, uh, the 2014 code. It the torque was referenced in a, an informational note, uh, and so there there's there was a change in the uh, 20. Uh, 17 and now the 2020 uh, 20, uh, National Electrical Code. Tightening torque values for terminal connections shall be as identified as indicated on equipment or in installation instructions uh, provided by the manufacturer. It used to say that we had to use a calibrated uh, tool in order to achieve the correct torque value. Now it was changed to an approved means shall be used to achieve the indicated torque value. And there's an informational uh, informative annex in the back of the National Electrical Code that's titled Recommended Tightening Torque Tables from UL Standard 486A and, and 486B. This has actually been in the National Electrical Code since 2011. All right, so here is an illustration, and it, it may be kind of hard to see the, the, the type of panel board this, this is. This is a square M. I know you've heard of square D, uh, but this is a square M. This is the Miller brand, the Charles R. Miller brand panel board. Uh, but the panel board, this panel board has a label containing the lug torque data, and they've had this data in panel boards forever. And in fact, it, it wasn't uh, specifically stated in the code book uh, until fairly recently, but it's been, there's other provisions that really said that we're supposed, well, for one thing, that where we started out a little while ago, uh, equipment has to be used and installed in accordance with the uh, installation instructions. Well, if the installation instructions give you the torque uh, data, then we have, we were supposed to go use that and, and go by that for, for years and years and years. When I was first learning to be an electrician uh, in the, um, a long time ago, it's not really saying how, what year, uh, I was taught that how you, how you connect, how you tighten it in accordance with the torque is a half a turn before it breaks. And I was taught a lot of stuff like that when I first started out. So a half a turn before it breaks, you know, the, the, my teacher, that my instructor with my foreman uh, was, was trying to be fun. All right, so we have the lug torque data that's on the panel board. Because the tightening torque values are provided, it is required to use an approved means to achieve the indicated torque value. And this is a, 
a torque uh, socket wrench. It is the Miller brand uh, torque socket wrench. Arc flash hazard warning labels. These have been in, in the National Electrical Code for a while. For the most part, uh, it, for a number of editions, it was just a generic label. We'll get to that on the next slide. Uh, what has to be labeled? Equipment, electrical equipment such as, now this isn't an all-inclusive list. It is. It says such as switchboards, switchgear, panel boards, industrial control panels, meter socket enclosures, and motor control centers that are in other than dwelling units and are likely to require. Here's the, okay, this label is not required in dwelling units, at least not yet. Uh, but it, it, what, it gives us an idea of the equipment above. Switchboard, switchgear, panel boards, industrial control panels, meter socket enclosures, motor control centers. These are examples. It's it's not all inclusive. It's not everything, but the the key part is, it is it likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized? Then, if it is, it has to be field or factory marked to warn qualified persons of potential electrical arc flash hazards. So what's required to be marked? Well, is it liable to require adjustment servicing or maintenance while energized? And, and uh, panel board, yes. Um, a transformer, you could argue, I could argue both ways on a transformer. Uh, I, I could argue, I, now I'm not gonna put a label on a transformer because if, if I need to do anything with it energized, it's gonna be closed up. I can do uh, voltage testing on the downstream device, on the, the lugs of the equipment it lands into, the disconnect that it lands into. All right, so here's an example of a, the general warning label, a basic label that's required by the National Electrical Code. Uh, this marking has to meet the requirements in 110.21b and has to be located so as to be clearly visible to qualified persons before examination adjustment servicing or maintenance of the equipment. This is 110.16a. This was a change uh, one or two editions back where they added, because uh, this was this is all that it used to be for a while, and then they added another section. So this, this terminology, this stipulation became uh, 110.16a. All right, and for the B part, and other than dwelling units, in addition to the requirements in 110.16, a permanent label has to be field, mark, field or factory uh, applied to service equipment rated 1,200 amps or more. This label has to meet the requirements of 110.21B, which is a labeling and marking requirement, uh, uh, and, and has to follow certain, uh, contain certain following information. All right, so this is this is required for service equipment, but only the larger service equipment rated 1,200 amps or more. What is it the label have to contain? It has to contain the nominal system voltage, available fault current at the service over current protective devices, and number three is the clearing time of the serv uh, service over current device, and uh, device based on the available fault current at the service equipment and the date the label was applied. So here is a, a warning label that is, is one example of a label uh, that this 110.16b is, is referencing. Okay, it's giving the available fault current at 31.5 kA or 31,500 amps. The, cl the fault clearing time is five cycles. The voltage is 480 volt. It has the date on there, and it, it specifies what equipment is the main service panel board. Now, the date, this is a label I made up. So I typically have dates on there that are important to me. Uh, that, that um, For example, this date, not the year, but the date, March 26, which wasn't very long ago, uh, March 26 is my wife's birthday. Now, I have never forgotten an important date yet, but if I ever do, 
between the books that I've written, my PowerPoint presentations, the ma magazine articles I've written, I can go back and find uh, find these dates, such as our, our, our my wife's uh, birthday, our anniversary. Uh, so the the other thing I I, I I wouldn't be smart if I did put uh, the year of her birth up there either, would I? So that's why I just keep it within a year or two or three of when I'm teaching. So I, I, I typically update the label. All right, so here's another example, uh, our flash warning. This this is a plaque that's on this, the switch gear. Uh, it has a main uh, service, uh, The uh, so it's 24,500 amps, the available fault current, the clearing time is two cycles. The voltage on this is 280 volt, uh, 9617. Uh, September 6 is actually my birthday. Of course, I'm not going to forget that. Uh, this label is required by 110.16b. We still have to, if we do that plaque that's above, we still have to have the label required by 110.16a. There's an exception. Service equipment labeling shall not be required if an arc flash label is applied in accordance with acceptable industry practice. Acceptable in industry practice, equipment labeling are described in NFPA 70E, the 2018 edition, standard for electrical safety in the workplace. All right, so here's, here's a label in accordance with well, it meets the art flash equipment label requirement in NFPA 70E. It, it has a it has all of the information on it that is needed for for um, with, in accordance with what's required in 70E. So therefore, it is a label that meets industry standards. And it also uh, warns, uh, it has a statement to warn qualified persons of the potential electric arc flash hazards. Disconnecting means. Each disconnecting means has to be legibly marked to indicate its purpose unless located and arranged so that the purpose is evident. And this was a change in the 2020 edition. In other than one and two family dwellings, the marking shall include the identification of the circuit source that supplies the disconnecting means. It, it seems like more and more uh, with every edition, we have we have additional markings, additional documentation, uh, which which this is great. This is it. It really helps us. To, to understand where, if we're, if we're at a disconnect, it means, and we need to shut it off uh, for, for uh, whatever purposes to, to change a motor, to, um, to do some testing, troubleshooting. Really good idea to know where that, that disconnect, it means, is is upstream from, from what we're working on at that point. And so um, this, this helps with NAPA uh, 70E. It helps with uh, electrical safety in the workplace. And of course, when we're, we're complying with 70E, we, we shut off the disconnects. We have to do things like live dead, live testing. We have to uh, is, is test for the absence of voltage and to put the equipment into an electrically safe work condition. And when I'm teaching uh, NPA 70E, uh, art flesh and, and electrical safety in the workplace, I'll ask the students, all right, the label says this, this breaker, this circuit goes to this equipment. And I'll ask in class, can you turn that off and, and trust your life? That, that that is correctly labeled and and the correct answer and, and the answer I always get is no you can't trust your life to that it's a great place to start but you cannot trust your life to the label being the information on the label being correct um, uh, in other than one two family dwellings it has to include the identification of the circuit source that supplies the disconnect means uh, the marking has to be of sufficient durability to withstand the environment. So here's an example. 
this circuit, uh, this disconnecting means on the left is from uh, the main distribution panel, circuit 246. Uh, it, is a it shows that it's the disconnecting means for uh, transformer CRM and the disconnecting means is legible. Now on the transformer, we, we have to have, uh, and this is out of another place out of the National Electrical Code, if the disconnecting means is not within sight of the transformer, it has to have a label uh, showing where the disconnect is. All right, so in, in Article One or Article 100 of the National Electrical Code, I, I mentioned that uh, if the disconnecting means is not within sight, within sight is defined in Article 100. Uh, within sight or within sight of, within sight from, it, it means that the disconnecting means has to be visible to, to your device you're turning on or off, and the maximum distance is 50 feet that it, they can be apart from each other. So it has to be visible and no more than 50 feet away, the disconnecting means. Well, this has been in the code for a long time. I have heard Someone once told me that where this came from was as far as the distance, because I'm, I'm thinking, why is it 50 feet? Why not 100 or why not 20? And, and someone said, well, if you're, if you're working on something and you've got it shut off, I've heard that 50 feet is the farthest you can accurately throw a pair of clients to knock them off to keep them from turning on your disconnect. Well, I know I could throw a pair of clients, lineman, lineman's pliers. I know I could throw clients 50 feet, but I don't know that I can be accurate at 50 feet. If I was coming up with that code rule, I probably would have put 25 feet there as the definition of within sight. Now, I don't know. I'm just I'm just repeating something that that I was told a long time ago. All right, marking is not required with that disconnecting means because the the purpose is evident. It's obvious. So the disconnecting means is within sight of that transformer. Uh, yes, it you it can be marked, but it does not have to be marked because it is it, it, it's its purpose is evident what it's uh, where it's going to new definition in article 2 uh, 20 uh, in article 100 in the 2020 edition it is the definition of uh, fault current comma available or what we we know of as available fault current it is the largest this is defined as the largest amount of current capable of being delivered at a point on a system during a short circuit condition the largest amount of current that's capable of being delivered at a point on the system during a, a short circuit condition. This definition even has a, an illustration. It's not color like my illustration, but it, it, there is a, an illustration uh, right beside the definition in Article 100. Now, this actually came from uh, NFPA 70E, Electrical Safety in the Workplace. The definition and the illustration was first put in last uh, edition, the, the, well, not the current one we have, not the 2021 edition, but the 2018 edition. This was put in, in the previous edition of 70E, and that's where it was pulled out from. So in a, a, a short circuit can occur during abnormal conditions, such as a fault between circuit conductors or a ground fault. Uh, so in the illustration on the right, we have an energy source. Um, the available fault current is coming out of that. Available fault current is right, uh, right before the overcurrent device. The equipment itself has a short circuit current rating, SCCR rating. Uh, the overcurrent protector device is the one with the interrupting rating. And it's also on the bottom showing the available fault current uh, on the uh, load side of the overcurrent device that's going to the load. So here's another example. Uh, this uh, Miller brand 
switchboard, uh, this uh, this aquarium, this Charles R. Miller, which is again a Cadillac of equipment. The available fall current at that panel board is is 52 kA. Uh, there's a 600 amp main breaker. The short circuit current rating of that panel board is 65 kA. All breakers in that panel board have an interrupting rating of 65 k AIC rating. Downstream from that, the available fault current in that panel board drops to 21,000 amps. It is a 200 amp main lug only panel board. The short circuit rating of that panel board is also 65,000 amps. The breakers in there because the uh, the available fault current is has dropped down to 21,000 amps, 21 kA. The breakers in that only have to have a 22 kAIC rating. So 110.24a says surface equipment at other than dwelling units have to be legibly marked in the field with the, the maximum available fault current. The field markings have to include the date the fault current calculation was performed and have to be of sufficient durability to withstand the environment that they're in. Uh, the calculation has to be documented. Uh, our, our, everything nowadays, everything has to be documented, so the, this is no exception, and has to be made available to those authorized to design, install, inspect, maintain, and operate the system. So this has been in the, the code for a while. Here's an illustration showing this. Um, my Again, my, my switchboard here, I've got the available fault current at 52,000 amps. The, the date uh, was on here. Uh, that in case you're interested, that date, not the, not the year, but the date, March 27, uh, is, uh, is our anniversary. Uh, so it, it has a plaque showing the available fault current. The short circuit current of the rating of that panel board is 65,000. It has to be at least equal to or above the available fault current. And the marking has to include, which it does, the fault current calculation that was performed and has to be of sufficient durability to withstand the environment. The available fault current markings addressed in 110.24 related to required short circuit current and interrupting ratings of equipment. Uh, in a PA 70E, the 20, uh, there was a change here. Uh, the 20 went from the 2015 to the 2018. Uh, because we, when the NEC, when this 2020 edition came out, the 2021 70E had not come out. It, it the, 70, the newest 70 e did come out last September. But it was a year this past September is when the uh, newest National Electrical Code came out. So that's why it's, it's only referencing the 2018 edition. It, it says this uh, standard for electrical safety in the workplace provides assistance in determining the severity of potential exposure, uh, planning safe work practices, and selecting personal protective equipment. The available fault current, it used to say available short circuit current, it was changed to available fault current, uh, and the date the available fault current calculation was performed has to be documented and made available to those uh, authorized to inspect, install, or maintain the installation. Uh, this, uh, the, these changes and the, this, these sections are in three different places. It says the same thing, but there in Article 409, uh, this, this, this requirement for documentation is in Article 409, Industrial Control Panels. It's in Motor Control Centers, which is Article 430. And it's in Air Conditioning Equipment, which is Article 440. And you can see the sections there, look them up at a later time. It, it'll, it says the same thing in all those different sections. So a Motor Control Center. It is required, uh, again, on a plaque in the upper right corner, showing the available fault current, showing the fault clearing time, showing the voltage, and showing the date of the calculation. Of course, right in the center is 
an arc flash warning label in accordance with, in the center upper part, in accordance with NFPA 70E. Uh, this plaque, of course, shows the, the, all the information required by uh, Article 110 and also uh, 430.99. Lockable disconnecting means if a disconnecting means is required to be locked open elsewhere in the code, it has to be capable of being locked in the open position. The provisions for locking has to remain in place with or without the lock installed. This is 110.25. This hasn't been in Article 110 uh, all that long. Uh, before it was in 110, every section that referenced that uh, the disconnecting means had to be lockable. Every section, for example, motors, uh, it, it tells us the general rule for motors is a, a motor has to have a disconnecting means uh, within sight of the motor. That's the, the general rule uh, in Article 430 tells us you have to have a disconnecting means within sight of the motor. There's an exception that says if the motor is has a disconnecting means that is capable of being locked in the open position, then it does not have to be within sight of the motor. So this the section in Article 430 for a long time always said that it it, it gave the exact instructions in Article 430 where the exception was. Uh, under the requirement for having to have a disconnecting means with inside of the motor. Then this section was moved to Article 110, 110.25, and, and now Article 430 references this, which I'll give you an example in, in, uh, coming up here. Uh, there's an exception for this, says the locking provision for cord and plug connection isn't required to remain in place without the lock installed. All right, so let's look back at and see what this really means above. It says, if a disconnecting means is required to be locked, uh, lockable open somewhere in the code, like such as motors, uh, it has to be capable of being locked in the open position. Here's a key part. The provision for locking shall remain in place with or without the lock installed. Uh, let's, let me go to the next slide. Here's a, a picture of a panel board uh, this isn't one of those Cadillac equipment um, Miller brand panel boards. Um, this panel board has these lock, locking devices that are installed uh, in, in, over the breaker behind the panel board cover. All right, so this, what it says, it has to remain in place with or without the lock installed. When this was first put in Article 25, uh, or Article 110.25, uh, uh, it, it, the wording that first went in there for one edition says the, the device has to be uh, permanent. Well, you, th that, that's really not what the committee meant, and there was the, they, they remedied it with the next edition because uh, these devices, these little brass uh, devices here, you take the panel cover off, you can pull that device off, put it back on, and so, see, technically they're not permanent. Well, the committee didn't mean it had to be permanent, so they changed the wording to what we have now, and it, it says it has to remain in place with or without the lock installed. All right, there's no lock on there. These devices that are used for lockout uh, remain in place with or without the lock. There's all types of devices. These are just uh, ones, uh, I think I was teaching in a, uh, this was a hotel where I was uh, teaching and I, there was a panel board in the room and there was a, a kitchenette in the room and looking in the panel board, uh, it, it, it showing, um, I saw these and thought, oh, that's, uh, that'll make a good picture for, for this section. All right, so here's, here's an example of a device that is not permitted if 
it is required to have a lockout device on on the circuit. All right, so the example of this is not permitted by 110.25 because this device will not remain in place after the lock is removed. In fact, you've got to remove the lock, you've got to take the, the plastic device off of the breaker in order to turn the breaker back on. All right, so probably what you're thinking is, oh, wait a minute, we, I've seen a lot of industrial applications where these aftermarket uh, breaker devices uh, are used for lockout tagout in accordance with electrical safety, in accordance with 70E, in accordance with OSHA. Uh, yes, absolutely. These are permitted by OSHA. They're permitted by 70E. What I'm saying is if the National Electrical Code has a requirement, uh, for example, maybe this is just a, a 120-volt motor, and and so it's out there, it needs a disconnecting means within sight. There is no disconnecting means within sight, so it has to have a, a lockout device on the breaker that would remain in place uh, once the uh, once the lock is removed. Well, uh, this it, it's fine. There's uh, it's perfectly fine to use this, but not if it's required to have this in accordance with the National Electrical Code. All right, say we're working on a a, a circuit, a 120 volt circuit out there in, in an industrial plant. And it, it's normally not required to have a lockout device on it. We can absolutely use these aftermarket devices to do our lockout tagout. Uh, numerous sections throughout the National Electrical Code reference uh, lockable disconnecting means. Instead of each sec section uh, re repeating the same requirement, and that's what I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, instead of it meeting, uh, repeating the same requirement, each section says the disconnecting means should be lockable in accordance with 110.25. So it, it was great that they took all the different wordings out of all these different sections throughout uh, the NEC, and they just reference now what the requirement, that it has to meet the requirement uh, in 110.25. Let, let's look at an example. Article 450 for transformers, um, 450.14 disconnecting means. It says transformers other than class two, class three transformers have to have a disconnecting means located either inside of the transformer or in a remote location. Or it has to have a disconnecting means, period. It can be with inside of the transformer, which a lot of them are, but it doesn't have to be with inside of the transformer. If it's not within sight, and it goes on to say where they're located in a remote location, the disconnecting means should be lockable open. That was really understood, lock, uh, but it, it, that wording was added for the 2020 edition. It has to be lockable open in accordance with 110.25, and its location has to be field marked on the transformer. All right, so... In that case, if there were if there were not a disconnecting means within sight of transformer, like one of my illustrations earlier, then that it would have to have that disconnecting means would have to be lockable in the open or off position. Well, actual safety switches uh, for many years now have had to be manufactured where they could be locked in the off or open position. Um, so say we've got a disconnecting means at the transformer and uh, we have a three pole breaker at the panel board, we're wanting to shut off power uh, to the disconnect itself in front of the transformer. Well, maybe we've got a three pole breaker supplying power to there so we can use it, an aftermarket device to, to put on that three pole breaker um, turn it off and lock it out and tag it out. And that that breaker uh, that is upstream from the safety switch that, that uh, at the transformer, the that breaker does not have to be, uh, the locking device does not have to remain in place with or without the lock.
Oh, so what are we going over today? Unused openings shall be closed to afford uh, protection substantially equivalent to the wall of the equipment. Certain electrical equipment has to be uh, shall be filled or factory marked for for a while there for one or two editions. It said it had to be field marked with that generic label. Well, it was a generic label, so it really didn't matter if you put it on at your shop or out in the field. It was just a generic label. Well, then they changed it to it, it had to be field or factory marked to warn qualified persons of potential electric arc flash hazards. Each disconnecting means should be legible, legibly marked to indicate its purpose unless located in a range so that the purpose of the disconnect is evident. Service equipment at other than dwelling units shall be legibly marked in the field with a maximum available fault current. Uh, if a disconnecting means is required to be lockable, open or off in the National Electrical Code, it has to be capable of being locked in the open position and the provisions for locking or the device for locking has to remain in place with or without the lock installed. I'm Charles Miller. Here's my uh, contact information. Uh, you've got my email. Uh, send me an email. Uh, and typically, if you do, uh, please uh, put your phone number on there because a lot of times it's easier for me to just uh, pick up the phone and call you back uh, as opposed to trying to go back and forth to get enough information to answer uh, some questions. Thank you.